Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to one more video on the Wars for Armageddon series. But of course, there has only ever been two invasions of Armageddon, both led by the green skin warlord Gazgul Mag Uruk Thraka, also known as the Beast of Armageddon. But let us for a moment consider a hypothetical scenario. Maybe, just maybe, the world of Armageddon was visited by something far worse than mere greenskins. Now, of course, this is a hypothetical scenario. Nothing that you will hear in this video actually happened, naturally. But still, let us for a moment delve into the hypothetical scenario of a first invasion of Armageddon. Say, for example, around the Imperial Year 444 in the 41st millennium. At this point in time, Armageddon had not grown to be quite the industrial powerhouse that it would eventually come to be. It was still a fairly important planet, and of course it was still relatively close to Terra, sitting slap dab on one of the few stable warp routes leading directly into the heart of the Imperium of Man. This alone made it worth defending, but it was not assumed to be under any real direct threat. The plant of Armageddon was heavily defended outside of the Armageddon system. Basically, any real threat to the Armageddon system would have to bash its way through a great deal of space before coming anywhere even remotely close to Armageddon itself. As such, it was relatively lightly garrisoned. As I have mentioned before, the Imperium is a very very large place, as such it cannot afford to let good Imperial Guard forces languish on garrison duty. These troops are much better utilized fighting wars throughout the Imperium rather than sitting on their asses, especially on a system like Armageddon, which is relatively well defended, naturally speaking, since there's just not a whole lot of enemies nearby. However, the Imperium is of course not only threatened by external enemies, it also has its fair share of internal enemies as well. Chaos, infiltration, revolutionaries, secessionists, etc. In the case of Armageddon, it had had a problem with Chaos cultists for quite some time, but it was assumed to be a relatively minor problem. There were some deviations in general life, but there was no real indication to suggest that there was a major Chaos ploy or anything, mostly just the usual low-key riffraff that the Adeptus Arbites should have absolutely no problems whatsoever cracking down on. There were certainly elements of Chaos Cultists, although they were also assumed to be in the minority. These were simply just pockets of riffraff, secessionists, and other rebellious forces, no real threat to Armageddon on a political, on a governmental, and certainly not on a planetary or sector level. And while there were certainly indications that some of these riffraff might be involved in something far more seriously, namely, for example, the worship of chaotic powers, this was again assumed to be a very, very small percentage. And even if a planetary governor has the suspicion, or indeed even hard evidence, that chaos cultists are active on his planet, generally speaking, they do not want to go running to the Inquisition about this shit because the Inquisition has a nasty habit of being, shall we say, somewhat heavy-handed when it comes to suspected chaos infestations. There are more than a few Inquisitors that subscribe to the good old-fashioned idea that there is no such thing as an overreaction when it comes to chaos. Naturally, no planetary governor with his senses intact will want to go screaming to that particular Imperial institution over something as potentially benign as a mere misunderstanding or just a handful of misguided people people sitting there in their basements reading occult books, not really understanding even what they're really doing. Especially considering the fact that the Inquisition might just go, hey, well, it's probably chaos, let's just fucking nuke the place. Which, to be fair, is 
and not an entirely unfounded fear. Unfortunately for Armageddon, however, their little insurrectionist problem turned out to be not quite as inconsequential as the authorities had hoped. Indeed, it would not be entirely unfair to say that the authorities of Armageddon had simply assumed that they were dealing with something along the lines of a firecracker. It would cause a little bit of noise, a little bit of light, might set a few buildings on fire here and there, kill a few thousand people at worst, but at the end of the day it would be a fairly minor event on a hive world. A few thousand people dead, that's a food riot, not something to really bother oneself about. What they were actually dealing with, however, was a slowly but surely growing supernova that had lodged itself deep within Armageddon's collective asshole and was currently getting ready to present itself to a wider audience with a mighty boom. The Imperial authorities of Armageddon had expected a mildly upset stomach. What they instead received was the taco shits from hell. The kind of horror that taints anything it touches. The manner of gastric outblow that irrevocably stains the very porcelain of society. A dyspepsy so devastatingly disastrous that it makes the question, is there a god, utterly meaningless, as the ass-wrecking pain cursing through your body makes the answer blindingly obvious, and as your very essence flows on a steady and viciously solid stream from your anus, you simply ask yourself what you did to piss said deity off to such a disp proportionate degree. For surely such a manner of hellish discharge could only ever be deemed necessary for the most base and vile heresy. And this was indeed the question Armageddon's planetary governor asked himself as he lay bleeding freely from a ferociously ravaged sphincter. Or to put events in a slightly less colourful fashion, Armageddon had suffered a massive civil uprising. It is not entirely clear precisely how it all happened and what sparked it. The planet had recently been engulfed by a warp storm, a relatively normal event. This is not a warp storm like, you know, sweeps in, turns the entire planet into a hellhole filled with demons and flesh-eating monstrosities. Warp storms travel through the Imperium, and in many cases they have no effect upon the real world, except fucking up trade routes. However, in this case it was a somewhat more powerful storm that had separated Armageddon from the wider Imperium. And while of course just a warp storm in and of itself is a fairly disconcerting event, it is not necessarily deadly. In fact, the severity can vary to a huge degree. A planet may simply be isolated for a few hundred years or days and suffer little to no ill effect. Indeed, its people might never even know it's there. Alternatively, the storm might cause the fabric of time and space to fray, weakening the borders between the Immaterium and our plane of existence. Best case scenario, this might cause some general distress and a sense of unease. Perhaps an increase in the birth rates of mutants, for example, you know, low-key stuff. Worst case scenario, the planet might be utterly drowned in chaos energies, mutating the population in a horrific display of chaos powers, and allowing demons to freely manifest and turn the whole globe into a charnel house. But in the case of Armageddon, it was a somewhat milder storm. It probably caused a general sense of unease and a slight increase in chaos influence, but these things were relatively minor. As I mentioned, it might increase the birth rate of mutants a little bit, but it wouldn't necessarily fuck over the system. What was far worse was the isolation. Without constant deliveries of food from the wider Imperium, Armageddon would quickly run out of food. And as such, strict rations had to be implemented planet-wide. It was during a relatively minor, and to be honest, probably fairly routine food riot that the whole mess supposedly started. A group of cultists are alleged to have started it and attacked the Arbites personnel sent in to quash the riots. This spread the unrest further and caused several other incidents. 
And so, as the chaos of large-scale civil unrest spread, the various groups of secessionists, extremists, cultists, and general criminal riffraff all leapt on the chance to further their own agendas. With the subsequent breakdown in civil order, the population at large also quickly began taking a part in the unrest. General panic turned to looting, as families attempted to secure the means of their own survival. Stealing food, fuel, power packs, all of the stuff you kind of need and, uh, in the midst of a mass civil uprising, might not necessarily have the ability to pay for. After all, if you don't take it, somebody else probably will. And this led to a further breakdown in public facilities, including, of course, public utilities like electricity, sewerage, water, etc. As these things also began to break down, public fears begin to rise. Tempers fray, and the people snap. Very soon, the looting will turn into sporadic outbursts of violence fighting over remaining loot, food for example, just fighting to protect your family, fighting against criminals who decided that, well, the Arbites are busy elsewhere, it's time for some good old-fashioned looting and repping. Suffice to say, the violence would start spreading rather quickly, and in an environment like an Imperial Hive, where thousands, if not millions of people will literally be sitting on top of each other, that violence tend to spread very, very quickly. Again, let me paint you a picture here. Generally speaking, Imperial Hives, the civilian part anyways, can be divided into hab blocks. These hab blocks can house millions. And these blocks are then in turn served by various merchantile districts, where food might be handed out in emergencies, and of course extra rations might be bought, traded in for ration tickets, and other luxuries might be purchased. Generally speaking, these merchantile districts will be relatively small. Due to the simple fact that within an imperial hive designed to house billions, space is obviously enough at a premium. During the course of just everyday business, these places are usually stuffed to the gills with people, with tens of thousands and possibly even millions of people passing through them every single day. Now imagine millions of people all flooding into that very same area with the intent of breaking into shops and acquiring whatever they need to keep themselves and their families alive. <laughs> It's, to put it rather bluntly, a somewhat volatile situation, and the moment violence starts, it is going to spread rapidly, and very, very soon, mobs of civilians will begin to form, either to protect themselves with safety in numbers, or to provide that very same safety in preying on others. Very, very soon, this will spill over into the hab blocks, and entire blocks will be quickly engulfed in thousands of individual conflicts. Imagine for a moment, if you will, millions of people cooped up in an area roughly the size of a fairly large skyscraper where your average family is going to be living in apartments some 20 square meters, if they're relatively lucky and they are indeed a full family. Individuals might be asked to stow together in 8 square meter apartments, again, if they're lucky. If they are not lucky, they will be resigned to sleeping in vast communal sleeping chambers, where they quite literally just stack bed upon bed upon bed upon bed. In all your reality, most truly industrialized hab blocks are not so much habitation blocks as they are places to sleep, and maybe, again, if you're lucky, prepare some food. Unless, of course, you have to eat in one of the large communal dining areas. To put it rather bluntly, in the case of a highly industrialized hive, like most of those in Armageddon were, the entire point of a habitation block is to squeeze as many humans into as small a space as physically possible. As you can probably imagine, this does not leave a whole lot of space for, um, uh, <laughs> leisure, or any kinds of actual, you know, living or habitating. It could perhaps best be described as a simple storage area where the various human components of the vast industrious hives of Armageddon are stored. 
Now, of course, there are exceptions. This is a bit of a nightmare scenario. There are hab blocks which actually give something along the lines of apartments to most of the inhabitants where they can live in, by imperial standards, relative comfort. Although even then we're probably talking about apartments maybe 10 to 20 square meters again, if you're relatively lucky. In either scenario, there's not a whole lot of space between the various families, or indeed the various individuals. Now throw in violent mobs roaming up and down the hab blocks, breaking into habitation units, stealing food, fuel, beating people, raping, pillaging, general nonsense. Then you throw in a fair few criminal elements with guns, you throw in some riot suppression squads from the Adeptus Arbites, and of course what happens when thousands upon thousands of people are all having a massive street brawl, well, shit gets destroyed. Now imagine the electricity going out. Sewage will almost certainly be destroyed and probably be running freely in the quote-unquote streets at this point. Fires will probably be ravaging considerable portions of the habitations blocks, while the rests might be slowly but surely covered in a blanket of oh-so-lovely smoke. Then throw in a general sense of panic, fear, and complete and utter disaster, and you have the perfect recipe for chaos. Not just simply civilian chaos, we are now talking proper chaos, as in warp chaos. Millions of people ripping and tearing at each other, both fighting to steal various stuff that they want, fighting to escape, fighting to get away from fire, fighting to get away from the smoke, shooting each other, killing each other, raping each other, being generally just turned into massively aggressive monstrous beasts, all confined into a tiny, tiny area. It is a scene from hell. And, at least I need to remind you, this is currently taking place on a planet in the midst of a warp storm. I don't think I need to tell you that the consequences of such actions are unfortunate. But before we get into that particular piece of nasty, let us take a general look at the situation. On Armageddon Secundus, where most of the hives were relatively close together, the various civilian uprisings had been halted relatively effectively by the dispatch of further Adeptus Arbites forces and also the Imperial Guard and PDF troops stationed across the planet. And you might ask, how the hell do you restore order in a hive containing billions of people all scared for their lives, running around fighting, rooting, stealing, burning, etc, etc, as their very world around them is exploding, on fire, and in various states of decay and collapse? Well, the answer is very, very simple. You deploy a police force, e.g. the Adeptus Arbites, and you simply make the civilian population more afraid of said police force than they are of anything else. Quite literally, the Arbites would march through the various hab blocks, shock malls and shotguns front and centre, and simply just murder anyone they came across that didn't immediately turn tail and run. And even if they did turn tail and run, they might shoot a few of those as well, just to hammer home the point that you probably should be running before you see the Arbites. To put it rather bluntly, a suppression action on this scale, within a hive in the Imperium of Man, resembles nothing so much as a military invasion rather than a mere policing action. The Adeptus Arbites will be roaring into the various hab blocks in armoured personnel vehicles, often just simply blasting at anything that moves with pintle-mounted storm bolters and heavy stubbers. In fact, you would probably prefer that the suppression efforts were carried out by the PDF and the Imperial Guard, the regular military, because at least they would hesitate for a moment before pulling the trigger. The situation on Secundus was um, chaotic, to put it rather bluntly, but it was at the very least starting to get under control. 
With the hives being relatively close together, that meant that if one hive managed to suppress the problems, or at the very least get them under control, it could very quickly dispatch reinforcements to the nearby hives, thereby of course having a domino effect on the others. This meant that even though Secundus was almost completely bereft of a common command structure for close to two months, being essentially completely and utterly given over to anarchy, However, the lower workings of the Hive's command structure had remained relatively intact, relatively speaking, in the sense of a raging civil war, with constant riots and running street battles. This meant that the various unit commanders of the Imperial Guard, the PDF, and the Adeptus Arbites managed to organize their own units relatively effectively, putting down revolts in their own sectors and then moving in to aid nearby sectors. This allowed them to hook up with other command structures, and eventually, over the course of the next two months, a coherent response was created. Over the course of something along the lines of six months, Armageddon Secundus was slowly but surely pacified and brought back under Imperial command. The total death toll is entirely unknown. As mentioned, this was pretty much six months of pure chaos and anarchy, with only the military and the Adeptus Arbites operating with any kind of structure or order. In other words, no one really had time to sit down and start counting the bodies. Considering, however, the sheer size of the civilian population and the fact that six months passed, with near constant civil war and almost certainly non-stop interruptions to necessary services – electricity, water, sewage, food supplies, etc. – the casualties must have stretched well and truly into the billions. In fact, I would probably go so far, and this is a personal estimate, but I would reckon that probably as much as half of the population was likely to have died during those six months. Just think about it. The civilian population would have been deprived of most of the necessities of life. Shelter, for example, would be hard to come by, as the various hablocks would certainly have been ravaged by the riots, fire, and other mishaps. Certainly, there are civilian shelters built into the hives, and there are also public institutions that could be open up to house the masses, but this would almost certainly not have been enough. Hives are usually, by their very design, packed to the absolute brim to begin with, and as such there is not a lot of spare room. Now obviously, the casualties will certainly have opened up a little bit of room, but it is unclear just how much. Additionally, we know that the food situation was already getting to be pretty goddamn dire before the riot started. With the rioting, the stealing, and the looting, food supplies would almost certainly be at a critically low level. Additionally, the infrastructure usually used to distribute said food sources throughout the hive, and again, I remind you, hives are massive. We are talking about hundreds, if not thousands, of kilometers of internal roadways, of transportation networks, railways, lift services, etc, etc. Just transporting food from the storage areas to the population alone would have been a Herculean task, and now much of that infrastructure would have been destroyed. But even more importantly than food is of course water. Again, Armageddon was not quite as heavily industrialized back then as it is in the modern Imperium, but even then it was a heavily polluted world. Sources of drinkable water would be very, very scarce indeed. The overwhelming majority of the population would have been receiving practically all of their water via the hive's plumbing, and occasionally purchasing small amounts. Even then, water was heavily regulated. For example, showering was not encouraged, let's just say. Water was most definitively a fairly valuable and relatively scarce resource on Armageddon. This, again, coupled with the simple fact that the vast majority of the infrastructure would have been at the very least damaged, and in many cases outright destroyed, would make the transportation of water equally complicated as that of food. And while people can live for quite a while without food, they start dying remarkably fast if denied clean water.
And that is, of course, not to mention the small problem that non-clean water presents. People will gladly drink practically anything, even though they know it's bad for them, if they're truly desperate, as the people of Armageddon was almost certainly at this point. And what does that lead to, ladies and gentlemen? That is correct, widespread disease. So to sum up, you will have millions of people cramped together in absolutely tiny areas, probably designed to fit a third of that number. You will have a lack of foodstuffs with weakened immune systems being a inevitable result of that. You will have a dire lack of clean water, which will in return almost certainly lead to disease, death, corpses lying around rotting as there's no infrastructure to remove them, which of course means even more lovely, lovely bacteria spreading amongst the population. And of course, said population, as previously mentioned, will be crammed together like rats in a sewage pipe. Yeah, the, um, the death toll would have been pretty fucking catastrophic. And I hasten to add, this is the part of Armageddon that got off lightly. Which quite reasonably leads us to the question of what precisely could be worse than that? Well, what about a demon invasion? You see, that whole warp storm thing wasn't just a good old coincidence. Things rarely are when it comes to the warp, and in this particular case we get to reacquaintance ourselves with the God Emperor's most disappointing child, Angron. Of the many, many genetically perfect little children that the Emperor created, none is quite as disappointing as Angron. He was the only Primarch to not gain control over his home world. He was the only Primarch that required saving from the Emperor. He was the only Primarch that did not even understand what his fucking legion was before he'd killed half of its command structure. Before Angron, the Warhounds had been a somewhat brutish, yet effective and reliable tool in the Emperor's arsenal. After Angron, the World Eaters turned into a virtually entirely uncontrollable mob, best just simply left in the rear lines to rot away. Oh, Angron. How you disappoint, Daddy. Now, granted, Ankron's backstory is actually fairly interesting, and it gives us a nice bit of insight into the Emperor and, of course, Angron himself, but that's a bit too complicated to get into here. All you really need to know is that after the end of the Horus Heresy, Angron, the disappointing son, ran back into the warp and was trapped within the Eye of Terror for the next 10,000 odd years, mostly just raging and ranting at anything and everything while he was stuck within the warp, being a rather useless little bastard to be entirely honest. And no doubt Angron was painfully aware of the irony that he had rebelled against the Emperor to make sure that he would be nobody's slave, and then ended up as, unequivocally, the slave of a far harsher master. And I am not exaggerating, Angron was essentially stuck on his demon world, with no way of leaving at his own volition. Eventually, however, Korn decided that he wanted to get something out of this most disappointing of children, and sent a massive space hulk, which Angron dubbed the Devourer of Stars. Now, I would also hasten to point out that Angron had absolutely no control over where said Space Hulk was headed. The World Eaters were simply just shimmered around the galaxy randomly by the forces of chaos, until eventually they were spat out above Armageddon Prime. Never having been a particularly bashful lad, Angron leapt on the chance to get some bloodshed in, and immediately ordered the invasion of Armageddon Prime. Or, well, perhaps calling it a planetary invasion is giving it a little bit too much credit. At this particular point in time, Angron was not particularly coherent. Granted, Angron had never been the most cunning or intelligent of Primarchs, but he had slipped very, very far, even from that relative low, and was essentially turned into just a blood-maddened beast. As such, it wasn't so much an invasion as Angron simply just dumping whatever he could get his hands on directly down onto the planet's surface, and then running amok for a few months. On that note, it is not entirely clear just how many things Angron could actually get his hands on. 
The World Eaters Legion as a whole had of course come out on the losing side of the Horus Heresy, no doubt taking significant casualties in the process. And to make matters considerably worse, after the defeat at the hands of the Emperor during the Horus Heresy, the World Eaters Legion engaged in the Battle of Skelthorax inside the Eye of Terror against the Emperor's children. During this particular confrontation, Karn the Betrayer finally got enough of his Primarch's bullshit and simply went on a complete and utter fucking rampage, cutting his way through his brothers and the Emperor's children alike finally completely and utterly shattering the World Eaters Legion. The Battle of Skelthrax was thusly the last time the World Eaters Legion entered battle as a coherent military force. At Armageddon, the World Eaters complement consisted of Angron's own Chosen, the Forsworns, Lord Skalchik's elites, the Skulltakers of Hans Korin, the Blades of Rage, and the Wraths. These were divergent warbands that only paid lip service to Angron, instead choosing to remain loyal to their individual warlords, as they had surely done a hell of a lot more for them than Angron ever had. As for the mortal followers of the Blood God, again numbers are rather unspecific, these are after all corn followers. They're not particularly fond of numbers. Additionally, any numbers that we do have, have probably been doctored rather heavily by the Inquisition, and should be taken with an astronomical load of salt. A very, 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 very very general estimate, would seem to suggest that there were somewhere between 10 to 20 million Chaos Cultists in the Invasion Force. This, of course, also an even more general estimate than I even made about the Orcs. In general, you can assume the Orcs to at least form into a rough organization along the lines of tribes. As far as various cultists and mutant cohorts are concerned, there is absolutely no standardization whatso bloody ever. In fact, even giving them the designation as cohorts feels overly optimistic. We do know, however, that there was an absolute fucking ton of the little bastards. We also know that there was roughly a quarter of a million of actually trained, trained, quote unquote, as far as corn is concerned, chaos worshippers in the invasion fleet. These would probably be ex Imperial Guard or PDF regiments, possibly even Imperial Army from the Horus Heresy. We also know that 12 Bloodthirsters were included in the Warhost. These were Korn's chosen. This is a formation of Bloodthirsters constantly in flux, where Korn's 12 most favoured servants of any time is included in their numbers. If one of them falls out of favour, he is immediately removed from the uh, quote unquote unit. The fact that Angron had managed to secure the service of these bastards suggests that he had remained rather violent even within the Eye of Terror, and must have been able to keep the Blood God rather entertained. Additionally, of course, we know of the cult on Armageddon itself. Again, obviously, numbers are virtually impossible to estimate, but a rough estimation would place their numbers somewhere between 1 to 4 million. And by the way, if you're looking, no, I'm not going to bother doing any fancy graphs on this, because these numbers are pretty much pure speculation drawn from the various sources that talks about this particular war. It is all pretty much pure guesswork, especially as those sources come, of course, from the Inquisition's own archives. A bit of a firmer number, however, is the traitor guard elements, the units on Armageddon that turn traitor. And this could be considered a relatively accurate-ish estimate. So we have round about 800 to one and a half million Armageddon Hive Militia turning traitor, along with somewhere along the lines of 130 to 240,000 Imperial Guard Steel Legion, along with only three regiments of Armageddon Ash Waste Militia. The Ash Waste Militia apparently proved to be remarkably resistant towards the lure of chaos.
It is also worth pointing out that at this point in time Armageddon was nowhere near as heavily defended. Best estimate states that there was roughly half a million to maybe, very maybe, one million Armageddon Steel Legion, most of which were either finishing up their training ready to be deployed or were currently being reinforced on planet, which means that many of the regiments that were stationed on the planets were likely to be understrengthed. We also know that the vast majority of the planet's defenders were its Hive Militia regiments. Again, these were much, much smaller than they were during the first and second Orc invasion, and probably numbered only about one to one and a half million. And considering the fact that somewhere close to half of all of these forces turned traitor upon the appearance of Angron and his World Eaters, it would be uh, no exaggeration to say that the defenders of Armageddon were retardedly outnumbered, probably to an even worse degree than during the Greenskin invasions. Luckily for the forces of Armageddon, however, this time the overwhelming majority of their enemies were exceedingly poorly trained and hilariously poorly organized cultists. Now, to give you a general idea of just how worthless in combat cultist is, imagine this. I said that the scratch companies formed during the Second War for Armageddon, from the dock workers, etc., to fight against the Hawks, had virtually no value in combat. They were very, very poorly armed and virtually completely untrained civilians, given auto guns or whatever else was available at the time. Their military worth was close to fucking zero, which is why the average squad was made up of 100 civvies and a single veteran guardsman to lead them. They were, in the strictest definition of the word, pure cannon fodder. Cultists are even worse than that. They are quite literally deranged men and women and occasionally even children, basically the entire civilian population of vast imperial settlements that have gone insane, driven utterly and completely bonkers by the presence of the warp. They have absolutely no concepts whatsoever of tactics, leadership, organization, and they barely understand how to use weapons. In fact, the overwhelming majority of them are expected to be wielding little more than melee weapons, crude axes, wrenches, pieces of metal, etc, etc. And even if they do have ranged weapons, they would probably be worse at using them than your average orc shooter boy. The only way to utilize these forces with any hope of success is to gather them up in their millions, and then simply herd them at the enemy in a massive rolling tide, hoping to overwhelm the enemy's abilities to kill them and therefore get them entangled into melee combat. Alternatively, these useless troops might be used as a distraction from the real thrust, which would almost certainly in this case be led by demons of corn or the world eaters. Luckily for the invaders, this was more than enough during the initial invasion of Armageddon Prime. The simple fact was that the Hives on Prime were far more scattered than those on Secundus, which meant that the various rebellious forces had managed to get a much, much better foothold, and had managed to disrupt the Imperial troops a hell of a lot more. Now, when you introduce Angron at the head of some 5,000 odd World Eaters, along with millions of mutants and Chaos Cultists, shit hits the fan at supersonic velocity. Oh, and by the way, the rough estimate of 5,000 World Eaters is also pure speculation. We have a rough idea that Angron brought something along the lines of five full companies of World Eaters. However, the name Company does not mean diddly dick when it comes to the World Eaters. Back during the Great Crusade, a company of World Eaters referred to a formation of roughly 1,000 Astartes. It could be bigger, it could be smaller. Even back then, the World Eaters were never particularly picky when it came to their organizational doctrines. At this point in time, however, there is absolutely no way of knowing how many Astartes would have been in these companies. There might have been far more than a thousand, there might have been only a few hundred, hell, there might even just have been dozens of them. 
and the sources vary greatly. Some suggest that there are around about 500, some suggest 5,000, which seems like a decent middle-of-the-road number, and some even suggest 50,000, which seems exceedingly unlikely. Even at the absolute height of the World Eater's power before the heresy, they only numbered 150,000 legionnaires. Only 150,000. But during the heresy, they would have taken significant casualties. And considering their complete and utter lack of tactical doctrine, I would be very, very, very surprised if there were as many as 50,000 World Eaters left at the end of the Horus Heresy. And after the disaster at Scalthorax and the shattering of the Legion, I would be exceedingly surprised if Angron could have gathered much more than 5,000. Even that number seems rather optimistic, to be entirely honest. But again, that didn't matter much, considering the relatively weak defences of Armageddon Prime. Its loyalist defenders were quickly routed and forced to flee through the equatorial jungle and meet up with the rest of the loyalists on Armageddon Secundus. This route would in all due likelihood not even have taken the full two months that we know the planet was embroiled in large-scale revolts. If Angron had pushed his advantage immediately, the planet of Armageddon would almost certainly have fallen right then and there. However, for reasons at that point unknown to the Imperial Defenders, the Chaos Forces seem to have absolutely no interest in crossing the Equatorial Jungle and invading Secundus. The reason would, however, make itself obvious in the next few months. Before retreating, the Imperial Commanders had, with remarkable level-headedness, realised that they would have to keep some forces on Prime, both to keep an eye on what the traitors were doing, and possibly also to send out a distress signal. As mentioned, the planet was currently engulfed in a warp storm, which meant that any SOS would almost certainly not be able to pierce the storm and make it to the wider Imperium. As far as the Imperium was concerned, Armageddon had reported some relatively minor problems with their civilian population, nothing that the Steel Legion and the local militia couldn't deal with. They had no way of knowing, or indeed even any reason to suspect, that Armageddon had suddenly been invaded by a chaos. Chaos Primarch. Thusly, it was vital for the Loyalists on Armageddon to get a message out, and they knew that the warp storms were slowly but surely starting to abate. They had probably been caused, in no small part, due to the arrival of the Devourer of Stars, along with Angron and his demon cohorts. But with the weakening of the storm, it might be possible to get a message out of system. But the assumption also had to be made that the Chaos Forces would attempt to intercept and or block any attempts at contacting the wider Imperium. As such, the Imperial Commanders came up with a rather brilliant, if exceedingly dangerous, and indeed downright sacrificial plan. Several cells of infiltration specialists would remain on Armageddon Prime, trying to hide out in the ash wastes, in the jungles of Secundus near the border, and even in the hives themselves. These infiltration troops would all be equipped with a single astropath. Once the storm began to weaken significantly, these astropaths would try and send a distress signal to the wider Imperium. The assumption was that the Chaos Forces would concentrate all of their blocking forces on Armageddon Secundus, since they assumed that no major forces remained on Prime, and therefore there would be absolutely no need to blockade communication on Prime. That assumption proved to be correct. The Chaos Forces concentrated all of their energy on blocking communication from Secundus. By the time they realised that there were still active astropaths on Prime, it was too late. The message had been sent. To the best of our knowledge, none of the infiltration specialists or the astropaths survived the ordeal. However, they died safe in the knowledge that they had achieved their goal. The distress message had been sent, and the wider Imperium now knew what was happening on Armageddon. And even more importantly, the Wolves of Fenris were now aware.
It would take months, possibly even years, for the Imperium as a whole to muster a response to an attack this deep within the Imperium. No one had expected a blow to fall on Armageddon, and certainly not a chaos invasion. Luckily for the population of Armageddon, however, the Space Wolves could react far quicker than the Imperium could. The Great Wolf himself, Logan Grimnar and his great company immediately set course for Armageddon. Knowing that he was dealing with a major chaos invasion, the Great Wolf also called upon the other great companies of the Space Wolves. It is unclear how many of the great companies arrived in time, or if all of them indeed did arrive, so the numbers are somewhat hard to estimate. If it was only the company of the Great Wolf himself, we're looking at some 250 Astartes. But if we assume that all of the companies made it to Armageddon in time for the final confrontation, then we are looking at anything from 2,000, maybe as high as 20,000 wolves. However, we do know that one source quotes that the wolves were outnumbered 10 to 1. Now, it is unclear whether or not this is referring to just general enemies, in which case, yeah, duh, as at the very least we're talking about millions of Chaos Worshippers, and after the fall of the Hives on Armageddon Prime, we're probably talking about billions of new converts on top of that. Again, their actual combat prowess would be virtually non-existent, but there would still be a absolute fucking ton of them. But honestly, this seems somewhat unlikely, because the Space Wolves probably wouldn't consider chaff like that to really be outnumbering them regardless of the numbers. So if we assume that they were talking about the World Eaters and that there were 5,000 of those, we end up at something along the lines of 500 wolves, which means that only Logan Grimnir's great company and perhaps one, maybe two others had arrived. Again, the numbers of a great company is complete and utter speculation, and we also know that the Logan Grimnar's great company is one of the smallest, seeing as it has also one of the highest numbers of veterans. But enough talk about numbers, let's get back to the whole war thing, shall we? The scouts of Logan Grimnar's great company arrived in Armageddon Prime before Angron made his next move. We also now know why Angron has been moving so slowly. Angron at this point had become a full-on demon Primarch. His original flesh and blood body would probably have been destroyed at some point either during the Horus Heresy or in the millennia afterwards trapped inside the warp. It is also possible that he has simply been so infused with warp energy at this point that he simply just ceased being as a flesh and blood human. Or, well, Flesh and Blood Primarch, anyways. The point is that at this point he was more demon than man, or Primarch, or superhuman, or whatever else you want to call him. And thusly, he was entirely reliant upon a constant stream of warp energy. As I talked about in my Chaos Explained video, demons can only exist in our world if they have a constant stream of chaos energy fueling themselves. Essentially, they are kind of like fish without water. If there is not enough chaos energy, they cannot manifest and they cannot stay in corporeal form, and will therefore dissipate. And considering the sheer numbers of demons in Angron's horde, and of course his bodyguards of twelve bloodthirsters, the Cruor Praetoria, he would have required a massive amount of chaos energy. Now to begin with, that was provided by the raging warp storm around Armageddon, however, this warp storm was now abating. As such, the demon Primarch had to find a way to provide himself and his followers with enough chaotic energy to sustain themselves. Thusly, he ordered the construction of a massive chaos temple on the surface of Armageddon. This huge edifice, built upon the bones of billions of civilians, would channel enough chaotic energies onto the planet to allow Angron and his followers to remain in the corporeal world. However, this massive edifice would take the lives of billions upon billions of humans, and would take months to construct, even with the magic of the Immaterium at his beck and call. And so it was quite simply impossible for him to launch an invasion against Armageddon Secundus before this construction work was completed.
This gave the survivors of Armageddon plenty of time to organize themselves and receive some outside reinforcements. It is not clear if other Imperial Guard forces were available, but at the very least the Space Wolves had arrived in considerable numbers. The Space Wolves quickly realized that if they simply waited for Angron, in all due likelihood he would simply smash them aside and continue on to Secundus. If he was allowed to release further bloodshed, he would be able to bolster his ranks yet more with further demons summoned to take part in the slaughter. Therefore, it was imperative that Angron's preparations be interrupted as much as humanly possible. To achieve this, Logan came up with a plan. Working on the assumption that the overwhelming majority of the Cornet invaders were, well, Corn invaders, he launched an attack out of the equatorial jungles with his Space Wolves. This rapid mechanized spear tip cut into the vast hordes preparing on the other side of the jungle for the invasion of Armageddon Secundus. This was an absolute slaughter. A mechanized spear tip of Space Wolves against hordes upon hordes of Chaos Cultists and a handful of scattered World Eaters. The Loyalist Astartes cut into them like a knife through butter, or to be honest, in this case, more like a grenade through butter, shredding vast hordes of Chaos Cultists before retreating into the equatorial jungle. But these, of course, just as the Space Wolves had assumed, were corn worshippers. And it will take a hell of a lot more than seeing tens upon tens of thousands of their friends and comrades blown into pasta sauce to discourage them from pursuing an enemy that was apparently running away. As such, a huge portion of the Chaos Horde simply streamed after the Space Wolves as they headed once again into the equatorial jungle. The Space Wolves had already cleared path through the jungles for their armored vehicles. They now streamed back through the jungle down these pre-planned paths, while all the time making sure that they kept contact with the hordes behind them dropping off units of Grey Hunters to engage with the enemy with massed bolt of fire before rapidly withdrawing and rhinos, whilst the units of Long Fangs placed on elevations in the terrain would pour a relentless stream of heavy bolt of fire frag grenades and LAS cannon blasts into the pursuing enemy, while squads of Sky Claws would jump into the disrupted forces and cut down anyone the Long Fangs had left unhurt. In this way, the quote-unquote retreating Space Wolves kept the enemies following them, kept them engaged in combat, kept them bloodied, and kept them from realizing that they were following the enemy straight onto their own turf. After almost a full day of running combats, the forces emerged on the other side of the equatorial jungle and deposited the ravaging corn hordes straight into a massed ambush organized by the Armageddon Steel Legion. The corn hordes were now gathered in a small area and stuck on the other side of a river, facing thousands upon thousands of well-entrenched Imperial Guardsmen with their Chimeras, battle tanks and artillery pieces raining destruction down upon them. Entire cohorts of traitor cultists were blown away in mere minutes, and those lucky enough to make it out of the jungle and down into the river now met the full force of the Space Wolves, standing knee-deep in the river, butchering anyone that tried to cross it. This merciless butchery continued for hours, with millions of Chaos Worshippers streaming out of the jungles into prepared firing zones, where they were hammered into bloody bits by continuous artillery barrages and thousands upon thousands of LAS guns rattling away at full auto. If they managed to get into the river, they faced the Space Wolves, who butchered the helpless mortals with contemptuous ease. Even during the best of situations, a mere mortal is absolutely no match for a Space Marine, and even less so a Space Wolf in close quarters combat. But in this situation, the massive Astartes warriors were barely hindered at all by the fact that they were wading in water up to their massive enhanced knees, while the mortals were stuck in that very same fast-flowing water up to their midsections, and had a considerably harder time staying on their feet. It was the kind of legendary one-sided butchery that the Astartes legions had been made for in the first place, 
where they could use their superhuman endurance and heavy protection to smash and rend and crush thousands, if not millions, of mortals charging against them with very little risk to themselves. This was a battle utterly without finesse, utterly without tactics, strategy, or any kind of technique. This was simply just a straight-up butchery, with walls of Chaos Cultists flooding into the river in their thousands, with barely any room between them, meeting the thin, sparse line of light blue space marines who laid into this mass of humanity with bolter and blade, until eventually the constant stream of Chaos Cultists would have to climb a mountain of dismembered corpses to reach the thin blue line of the Emperor's Executioners. But throughout hours of murderous butchery, the Red Angel, Angron himself, had not shown himself. It would appear that some vestige of the Primarch still resided within the bestial exterior. He had recognized the Space Wolves' trap for what it is, a murdering ground, a place for them to simply grind his army into bits. And instead of simply forging headlong into it, which would not have been particularly surprising, considering, and probably would have been what Logan had hoped for, he had diverged from the main flow of the Chaos Cultists, striking out further to the north of the main battle area, heading straight towards the Hives, Infernus, and the Hell's Reach. His objective, undoubtedly, was to lead a bloody wedge of his most elite and loyal World Eaters, along with the Cruor, Praetoria, and any cultists and traitor forces he could draw to him straight towards the relatively unprotected Hives of Infernus and Hell's Reach. He recognized that to create this killing ground, the overwhelming majority of the Imperium's defenders and the Space Wolves would have to be focused in that small area which meant that the Hives and their billions of inhabitants were left with virtually no defences. If Angron and his World Eaters could make it inside these Hives, not only could they wreak a bloody havoc upon the civilian population, they could go to ground within these mace-like structures, spreading violent and death possibly for months, maybe even allowing him to regain control of the situation by establishing further warp rifts and calling in reinforcements in the form of demons from the Immaterium. Recognizing the threat, Logan Grimnir took whatever forces he could off the defense of the river and headed straight towards Angron's position. This honestly seemed like a bit of a desperate gamble. Even if the Space Wolves are mighty warriors and Logan Grimnar has nothing to sneeze at, this is still Angron, at the head of twelve bloodthirsters we're talking about here. It is a rather nasty thing to take on without a plan. The hope, in all due likelihood, was that Angron would come streaming out of the jungle along with all of his cultists and be suppressed by the mass bombardment of the Imperial Guard. His bloodthirsters smashed across the landscape by huge rolling barrages of Earthshaker fire. But now, the Space Wolves would have to engage Angron, his bloodthirsters, and quite likely a considerable number of his World Eaters in the open, without a real advantage or a clear plan. Fortuitously for Grimnir, he did not have to face an angry demon Primarch alone. The Inquisition had also heard news about what was happening on Armageddon. Indeed, there are indications suggesting that they knew about Angron's arrival long before Angron knew where he was going to be ending up. And knowing that even such a force as the Space Wolves would be hard-pressed to take on a demon Primarch with the numbers available to them, the Inquisition, or in this case more correctly, Aldo Malus, dispatched their own military order to take on Angron. This took the form of 109 Grey Knight Terminators. The Grey Knights had been in system for quite a while, presumably unknown to the Space Wolves and the wider Imperial forces. On a signal from their Inquisitorial Masters, the force teleported directly into the Demonic Horde and launched an attack upon Angron and his Cruor Praetoria, hoping to destroy him and therefore shatter the rest of the Demonic Horde. 
Even then, though, this is still Angron we're talking about here. A demon Primarch, no less. In fact, he was so goddamn good at what he did, he could kill five Grey Knight Terminators in a single swing. Partially due to his incredibly powerful weapon, the so-called Black Blade, which was a demon weapon forged for Angron by the Dark Mechanicum shortly after Angron's ascension during the Horus Heresy. This incredibly powerful demon-infused weapon was somehow destroyed by a young Grey Knight by the name of Hyperion. The destruction of the blade and the resulting backlash and chaotic energy caught Angron off guard and made him stagger. This was all the opening the Grey Knights needed as they threw everything into one last assault to banish him, succeeding in doing so, banishing him back to the warp for 100 years and a day. And with Angron's banishment, the rest of his demonic horde began to collapse. The Chaos Cultists, now utterly bereft of leadership, also began to scatter. The remaining World Eaters, realizing that this campaign was well and truly at an end, either desperately tried to escape the planet and head back into orbit, or simply threw themselves at the Imperial forces that now horrifyingly outnumbered them. Final victory belonged to the Imperium, although the cost had been steep indeed. Only 13 of the original 109 Grey Knights survived. The casualties amongst the Space Wolves and the Imperial forces are unknown, and that is in large part due to what happened next. The Inquisition is rather testy when it comes to chaos, corruption, and its influence, and the planet of Armageddon had quite clearly been utterly submerged in it. Additionally, the planet, its military, and its population had been made aware of the presence of a demon Primarch, and that is not the kind of information the Imperium is particularly fond of the masses being made aware of. As such, the Inquisition determined that the entire population of Armageddon would be exterminated. However, the planet itself would not be subject to the ultimate sanction of exterminatus. It was too valuable. The lingering taint was deemed acceptable, but the population had to be dealt with including both the civilian and military forces. The Space Wolves violently resisted this order, going so far as to engage the Inquisition in open warfare. But that is a story for another time. The Imperium had won, although the Imperial population of Armageddon was not going to be allowed to enjoy the fruits of said victory. The entire population was rounded up and either immediately exterminated or sterilized, and then placed into work camps where they would be worked to death. And when the Space Wolves attempted to save a small portion of the population by bringing them onto mass transport ships and attempting to escort said ships out of system, they were attacked by the Inquisition and the Grey Knights. The civilian transport ships were destroyed, and this signaled the start of a large-scale war between the Space Wolves and the Inquisition. This conflict would later be known as the Months of Shame for the Grey Knights. I'm sure I'll eventually get around to covering that as well, but for now, this has been the final episode in the War for Armageddon. During the course of this series, we have looked at both of the Orc invasions and now also the classified information relating to the first invasion of Armageddon. An event that, by the way, is a little bit odd, because there are some canon conflicts here. In the book Hellsreach, it seems that the population that repopulated Armageddon knew about the First War, at the very least in passing. They knew that the planet had been invaded by chaos, but they did not know about the measures implemented after the war. I think this is mostly a mistake by the author, seeing as the Inquisition would never let the new population know what happened to the old one. That would be a very... Very bad idea. Imagine the recruitment posters. Armageddon! Recently we murdered the entire fucking population, and now we are seeking new applicants. Come to Armageddon. If you feel fucking lucky, punk.
But of course, that is all more or less besides the point for now. I have been Arch. Thank you very much for listening, and I do hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.